Well, welcome everybody to the session on um, goats as we were <laughs> talking about uh, our, our goats and um, how to maybe make a little bit more money on that cow-calf operation. Uh, thanks for again joining us for the Ranchers Thursday Lunchtime Series. We're excited to have you have you back today. And um, as a reminder, always, if you missed a session or you want to take uh, take a few more notes on something that's been delivered previously, you can see all the previously recorded sessions at beef.okstate.edu. We've got one more uh, presentation uh, from Dr. Lawman actually next week, and um, so that will wrap up this series as we we finish out uh, finish out reducing those costs in your cow calf operation. But today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about goats, and we're really privileged to have JJ Jones, one of our area agricultural economics specialists. Uh, JJ is a familiar face on on this topic, having led multiple uh, goat boot camps. Very, very popular on the the goat boot camps. You're gonna have to remind me, JJ. Those fill up pretty quick when you put the offering out. You're maintaining a waiting list, as I remember. That is correct. We already we're already full for this year's, and and got a waiting list for next year's. So. All right, I'll try to put that in the chat in case um, you're looking to be added to that waiting list. And uh, recently, JJ also led the group on the Cattle Women's Boot Camp that was very successful and uh, looking to host one of those in the near future too uh, for, for our cattle women. So with that, JJ, I'm, I'm not gonna take up too much more time. Let's, let's get into the good stuff. Okay, well, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to y'all today. and and. And and really, I do realize the uh, the, the what your the oh, I'm lost for words. But anyway, opportunity today because I know mostly you you know you talk you know, most guys are probably cattle producers and and we'll talk a little bit about that and how goats are probably you know I I remember growing up in Southwest Oklahoma you know we when we talked about goats it was never in, in a good way and so goats really weren't ever seen as a viable. Uh, commodity, but we're going to talk a little bit more. I think that has changed, and so I'm going to share my screen here. And I hope y'all are seeing uh, this uh, screen here, and so uh, we've got it here. I've just titled this Reducing Cost uh, with Multi-Species Grazing, and so kind of get into this a little bit. You know, kind of what is multi-species grazing, you know, and, and I know this is kind of elementary, but I thought I'd kind of go over it just a little bit, but it's you know, basically we're grazing one more, one more than one kind of livestock, you know, cattle, sheep, goats, horses on the same acreage of land. And, you know, this can occur at the same time. You can run the, the herds together. You can run them separately, you know, different paddocks and different things. It's really kind of up to you and your production schedule and how you want to run things. This isn't a new concept. And be honest with you, this is the way Mother Nature intended us to be. You think back you know, you know, the 1800 before he, you know, invented barbed wire and, and started fencing off paddocks and stuff. That's the way mother nature intended all these animals grazed together. And the, really the concept is it's kind of like taking a group of people to a buffet line. And some people are going to eat, you know, they'll, they'll go to the salad bar and they'll eat the, the, the lettuce and they'll eat the dressing and the cheese, but they're going to skip that three bean salad or that macaroni salad. But there's somebody, you know, out there that's going to like that, uh, that macaroni salad. If, there, if they didn't, nobody liked it, it wouldn't still be out there on the salad bar. This is kind of the same concept. There are, you know, multiple types of grasses and forages and different things out there available. And there's stuff out there that cattle won't eat. There's stuff out there that sheep don't really want to eat. And there's stuff out there that goats don't want to eat. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and how that all works together. But before we get started, I kind of want to show you this. <clears throat> this comes from one of my favorite movies, and this is what I understand most cattle guys think about sheep producers, you know, uh, or goat producers for that matter, you know. It, and and I really, the other day I was looking, I, I even found an old Droopy, the dog cartoon, where he was the sheep farmer and the wolf was the cattle farmer, and they were fighting out with each other. And so that this, you know, that kind of thing stems, you know. It's kind of deep seated, deep rooted back in the you know 1800s. You know, cattle and sheep farmers didn't get along. And then, if you ask people what they think of goats, this is the picture that most people see uh, them on top of the car uh, car hood. You know, on top of your car. And if I could have found a picture of one eating a tin can, uh, that's what I know. Growing up, that's what I kind of thought of goats. They were just 
you know, not that important and more of a menace than an actual true commodity. And then people, you know, they think about sheep, you know, uh, I couldn't find one of the sheep with four legs up in the air, but, you know, I've always was told that sheep were just an uh, animal looking for a place to die or just, you know, bait for uh, uh, coyotes. And so that's what we're kind of fighting, you know, the, the perception of what sheep and goats are compared to cattle, but that's far from the truth. So uh, why goats? And, and this is the reason I showed this. This is, this is the average goat price for the San Angelo, Texas market, which is the biggest uh, uh, goat market in the world, or in the, world, in the United States. And, you know, th that market kind of drives the Oklahoma market. And you can kind of see here that since, you know, we kind of got prices going back to the 90s. But since then, you know, and, and I kind of got into this the goat market deal around 2003 or four. And I remember selling goats for a dollar a pound or less, but you can kind of see prices have steadily gone up. And what it is, the market has been trying to buy more and more goats right? because there is a big demand for goat meat. And, and although none of us may eat goat meat, there's a, a growing section of the population out there. And, and generally, they're ethnic populations that they grew up or they that's what they know is eating sheep and goats. Because once you go outside of the United States, goat, sheep and goat protein is the number one protein source. It's not cattle. It's, you know, whereas here in the United States, sheep and goat protein is probably five and six. You know, it's after, you know, the, the, after beef, pork, chicken, turkey, fish, and, you know, all down the line. But, but it is a growing, pop, uh, growing demand. And the market has consistently tried to buy higher, you know, buy more and more goat meat. And you can kind of see here the five-year price average that we've been having is over three dollars a pound uh, for goats. And if you kind of look here, in last year we averaged three eighty-four. We don't, you know, there's times that we've been selling goats for over four dollars a pound. And so, uh, pretty pretty easy to make a profit when we're selling goats this high. And you know, kind of go to the demand a little bit here. This is the imports. This is we we import a lot of frozen goat meat uh, and. It's my understanding that the ethnic markets prefer fresh goat meat to frozen, but when we can't provide that, you know, supply that demand, we have to import it in. And, and here, I put this in here, you know, we hit an inventory peak of like 2.6 million head in 2006, and that's kind of where we've been. We've dropped off. We're at 2.1 million head now, but you can kind of see imports have just gone up, up, and up, and up, uh, you know, record year of over 20,000 metric tons. And, you know, I know that may not sound like a lot, but when you do the math, uh, you know, it's that's a lot of goats, uh, 20,000 metric tons. And so and then you can see here that we've tapered off a little bit only because Australia has gone through some um, trouble time periods. And that's where we're supplying most of our goat meat. And while this supply of imported goat meat was down, that's when our prices started really rocketing up and going up to that, you know, four dollar mark. So. Uh, markets trying to buy more goats. When we look at sheep, uh, you know, I'm talking. When I talk sheep, I'm I'm talking about hair sheep. I'm not going to talk about wool sheep. I I'm not saying that the market out there for wool sheep is a, you know not a good thing. But really, truthfully, here in Oklahoma, I, I I think when you talk about sheep, the only people that really have the wool sheep here in Oklahoma are the club lamb folks. And so when we talk about production, you know, we're talking about hair sheep. Why, you know. <laughs> When we look at hair sheep prices, there seem to be a little more closer related and tied to goat markets. Uh, I don't have to shear a hair sheep, which the wool price right now, you know, usually it, it's not a real good for the wool sheep right now anyway. So I don't, but I don't have to shear these hair sheep. And then again, I don't have any research to back this up, but what I've talked to when I talk to people that have raised both wool and hair sheep, they always tell me that the management on hair sheep is a lot simpler, a lot easier than what it is on wool sheep. So that's what we're talking about. And then when we get to uh, the prices, and, and I know this yellow line is depressing, and that's because we've seen some uh, downward pressure in the in the both sheep and goat market here lately. Uh, it's not due to demand, it's due to the economy and stuff. But you can kind of see here, hair sheep prices are pretty good. I mean, we're anywhere between two and three and a half dollars a pound. Uh, last year, we uh, hair sheep typically brought over three dollars a pound. And when I say the weight class, I'm looking. We're looking at sixty to seventy pound. That's what typically the market's looking for. And so we've seen really good prices. So kind of back to my story is we're seeing really good prices in in a 
and goats. We're seeing really good prices in hair sheep. And so that kind of makes these a little bit more economically viable and, and a good replacement. So let's talk about uh, uh, why this all works, okay? So when you talk about cattle, you know, they're roughage feeders, they eat grass. You can kind of see this pie chart here. The majority of their diet is gonna eat, you know, be that grass diet. They'll eat some forbs and forbs is just a fancy word for weeds. There are some weeds out there that they will eat. And then they'll eat a little browse, you know, they'll browse on some of the trees and some of that kind of stuff. When we talk about sheep, we call them intermediate feeders. They're more kind of along the lives, uh, line of forbs, the weeds. They'll eat a lot of weeds. They still will eat uh, quite a bit more grass uh, than, than, than what goats will eat. And then a shade bit more forbs. And then we are, are yeah, browse, I mean. Then we look at goats and their concentrate feeders. They like the browse. They like to, they like the the, the trees, the leaves, the uh, poison ivy, the honeysuckle. Uh, I've seen I've seen uh, goats strip cedar trees. I've seen goats uh, strip bodark trees. You know, they again. That's what they prefer. Now, don't get me wrong. They will eat grass, and I know it's out there on the internet and and different things that goats will not eat Bermuda grass. Uh, I'm going to tell you that's wrong. It's, it's just like the salad bar example I gave earlier. It's not that they, you know, won't eat it. This, they don't prefer it. And so if there's something else out there, uh, they will go eat it first and then, you know, they'll kind of eat it, you know, eat Bermuda grass last or grass last. But I will tell you, so my little operation where I have sheep and goats, if they didn't eat Bermuda grass, they'd be in trouble because that's because of the goats. They have turned it into a better Bermuda grass pasture than it was when I, when I first uh, bought this place. And so, yeah, so they, they will get around to eat it, but they just don't prefer it. And they just believe, you know, more of the other stuff. And kind of another representation kind of, and I like this graph a little better, and, you know, this is your pasture. If it looks like these browse, you know, that's where goats fit in. You know, the sheep kind of fit into all three, but the cattle kind of fit more into the grass side of things. And so that's the reason why these, these three species work really well together. Uh, you know, notice we don't throw horses in here or we don't, you know, pigs in here. So, because, you know, but these three kind of complement each other and, and it works really well to graze these. And so another picture that I like to show, this is a, a, a picture of, of a pastures that on one side is a monoculture. It's a cattle only. And on the other side, it's cattle and sheep. And notice the difference between the pastures and stuff. And so that's, that's why, the, you know, again, one of the things behind this is that the sheep and goat our sheep goats will eat not what the cattle is and it'll keep that weed pressure down because you know cattle will go in and they'll eat the grass that they like and that gives just more freedom for the weeds to pop up because they're not going to eat them so they're not you know they're going to keep them there and they'll spread whereas on the other side you know cattle and, and, and sheep are eating the same thing or you know cattle are eating the grass sheep are eating the weeds and now the pasture seat is a whole lot better for both of them in that. So that's the reason why that works. And so uh, that's the reason why we kind of promote this. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about some of the advantages of, you know, why we want to multi-species graze. And the very first thing, and, and we've got, a, a, there's research out there that shows that we can increase the carrying capacity or the stocking rates of the, any uh, pasture or any uh, grazing land by about 24, 25% with sheep and cattle more than cattle only. And, it, and, and goats, uh, Dr. Lawman and I were talking before we started, it might even be higher for goats because goats again are gonna be in the trees and graze uh, other places. But uh, again, I don't have any research data to back up the goat side of it, but it, it is apparent and, and proven that we can inc increase the carrying capacity of a parcel of land by multi-species grazing. Again, it's kind of depend on that vegetation that's available. But the one thing that I think, and this is what I've been telling, I think cattle producers have been missing out on for a long time, especially when the goat prices started going up, is the profit potential that we have in raising these sheep and goats, because I think that they are uh, viable economic options. Uh, and, and again, not only make us money, but save us money too. And so. So I, I, yesterday I went ahead and I updated the, all the budgets uh, that I had using today's prices. So I, I put down there $375 a ton for, for, hay, or for feed. 
uh, put down the fifty or hundred dollars a ton for the hay, and I know that might be a little more expensive, but that's about what's going it's going for around here. And so you know, I put in, I went and looked up the current uh, prices for all the shots that we need to give, all the wormers and stuff we need to give. And I'd be honest with you, the most expensive feed that I had to buy, and we'll talk about them here in a minute, is for the guardian animals. You know, that's more expensive than show feed right now. And I put, you know, we have to feed those animals. And so I put all this in and, I, and you look at here, you know, cattle, uh, we can make about $41 a head is what OSU is showing profit. Sheep, not as much, 29 bucks a head. Goats, a little more, but goats and sheep, goats and sheep are not the same as one cow. It takes about five, we estimate five sheep or five goats to equal a cow. So when you put them on the same equivalent, you can kind of see the price difference here, you know, about $150, $200. And most of the cattle guys that I know and that I work with right now would just pretty much give their eye teeth to get this kind of profit from their cattle. And so, but I'm not saying give up cattle. This is, uh, this is profit we can make in addition to cattle. And, and so it, there is a profit potential, but now I'll, I'll get to some of the pitfalls and some of the things here in a second. So we're going to have multiple profit centers. We're going to have cattle, we're going to have sheep and or goats and, and work. And then it improves our cash flow because if we do our production uh, uh, right, we're actually be selling different times of the year. So we'll actually have money instead of, you know, only having money coming in when we sell our calves, we'll have money coming in when we sell our goats, when we sell our sheep, when we sell our calves. And that could be different times of year and helps with our cash flow uh, for our operation. Some more advantages that I, I think are, are for this uh, type of operation. We can, it's been proven, we, we improve the animal health of both species. Uh, one of the big problems, and we'll talk about this again, is the parasites uh, on the sheep and goat side of it. But it actually helps the sheep and goats to run with cattle. It kind of reduces that parasite load. Uh, not, not, does not say eliminate, does reduce. And so that does help. And then it help, does reduce disease transmission too as well. So that's all been proven. So it improves our animal health. And then I've already showed this, we can improve land condition. It may reduce, and I, and I put in may because again, you know, goats and sheep are not overnight weed control. Okay, it is a process. And if, and if we don't stock heavy enough and the weeds are still keep, keep, keep up or keep ahead, we still may have to do some type of, of spraying, but we can reduce or eliminate the need for weed spray. And what we can control, we can control blackberries. And I know this is one that uh, most cattle producers hate is the Cerisa lespidiza. This is like candy to the sheep and goats, okay? They love it and uh, they will help control it. Pigweed, uh, there's not a stitch of pigweed in my goat or sheep pens uh, at the house because they will eat it to the ground. And there's many others that we can go through. Now, I will tell you, if your place or your pastures ate up with bitter sneeze weed or goat weed, these animals won't touch it. Uh, that's the two, that's, uh, uh, well, the bitter sneeze weed is a problem that I have at my place. And the other one I have is, is annual theron or tickle grass is what I call it. Uh, goats and sheep won't tackle that. So I, you know, again, kind of goes back to may reduce because if I have these weeds, I can't do that. And when we look at the cost, you know, you're looking, and again, I went and updated it to today's uh, current prices. You know, you're looking at saving. If I if I can reduce or just re, you know eliminate it, you're looking at saving anywhere from you know ten to twenty dollars an acre in weed control cost. You know, that's and so if we're looking at you know uh, profit, you know, we just we just made us twenty dollars an acre, you know, extra money that we didn't have to spend because we own these animals and these animals if done right and if managed right, will actually make us a profit. So we actually get paid to control our weeds and our, our other things. So again, that's uh, you know a plus. Now, there are some challenges. Uh, and you notice I, I've got up here, if your fence is this five strand or six strand bob wire fence, uh, you're not gonna hold a goat. Uh, the, old, uh, the old saying is for goats to test a fence to see if a goat will stay behind it is you need to take a cup of hot coffee and you go up and you throw that hot coffee against that fence. If that hot coffee goes through that fence at all, a goat will be able to go through it. If it bounces back and hits you, then the goats will stay behind. 
it's a little extreme, but that's not too far from the truth. Goats will, uh, <clears throat> they will find every hole that you have in your fence, every hole. And it doesn't matter really how much grass or feed or whatever you have, they, they always think the grass is always greener on the other side. So we're gonna have to do a little bit of working on our fence. And so now sheep, not so much. Uh, we could actually do a little less sheep. Uh, they might stand behind that fence, but I, I don't feel comfortable saying they will. I, I know people that keep them behind uh, fences like this, but I don't know that I would wanna try that. So, but the solution to it is not hard. It's just a little bit of pricey right now buying a fence material. So. The first easy thing to do is we can add electric fence, just kind of add a, a, a wire, maybe a couple of wires at the bottom of the fence because really sheep and goats are not gonna jump a, you know, a five foot tall fence. Uh, so we just, they're gonna try to go through the bottom part of it. So we add an electric part of it, you know, wires two cents a foot, insulators are about 68 cents a post. But the big thing is the charger. You can't cheap out on the charger. You can't go buy the, the, the simple, the cheap old cash, uh, a cattle charger, you're going to have to have one that's labeled for goats, which is a higher output because goats can take a little bit of more shock. And so we need a, just a kind of a higher output charger. And so that's a little bit of money. Uh, to me, the easiest thing for most cattle producers or people that have these type of fences to do is just add a couple of extra strands to bob wire fence between like this bottom picture has. And, and instead of having stays that are 12 inches apart, now you can put them six inches apart. And if, you're, if you've got a tight enough fence, and you can't have a sagging fence, but if you have a tight enough fence, if you can add that barbed wire down there, you, you're gonna eliminate most of your problems. And right now at today's prices, that's about 10 cents a foot. Uh, if you've got kind of what I call the old wavy sagging you know, fence that's really loose, uh, it may be just better just to go add, a, you know, buy the field fence or hog wires, some people call it. Uh, right now, that's a dollar and thirty-six cents a foot. You can just lay this up against that barbed wire fence, and that'll solve your problem. So that's to me, that's the biggest problem uh, <clears throat> that the cattle guys or guys with this is going to face is the fencing. Uh, then we get to the next biggest problem, and this is our challenge. I shouldn't call them a problem. I want to call them a challenge because every one of these things is easily fixable. Uh, but the very the next thing. And you probably have heard this about sheep and goats is parasite control. It's a number one challenge when it's, you know, once we get them to keep them in the pastures is sheep and goat producers <clears throat> is this parasite control. And this little barber pole worm that I have over here. And you can see that that's the number one thing that we face. Now it is not unmanageable, but it is something that I think most cattle producers are not used to. And it's and just the management of this is going to take a little bit more time uh, and, and effort, but it can be done, and it, and 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 we've proven it. We've got research that shows that you can do it, and you know don't believe everything you see on the internet. The ones the folks that are having trouble with parasites are the ones who are trying to either generally they're trying to overstock their pastures, graze the ground too cl uh, close to the, you know graze the pastures too close to the ground. And, and wanting to, you know, basically chemically worm these animals every 30 days and creating resistance problems. So uh, again, there's ways around this. The next thing that you're gonna have to challenge your face, you will need some type of guardian animal. Uh, that picture about the, uh, the wolves chasing sheep is not far off, uh, but you will need something, dog. And that's what I'm gonna promote first is dogs. I think dogs are the best guardian animals, but you have donkeys and you have llamas. I think it is probably a necessity uh, just because, you know, if you're in a high, heavy like coyote area, uh, the dogs and stuff will basically they'll help you make money because they'll help keep those babies from being uh, a coyote bait. And then also too, the way I, I would look at it though, this is also a plus because now if I've got dogs around for the sheep and goats and the dogs are not going to bond with the cattle, they're going to bond with those sheep and goats more than likely. Uh, but they're still going to be out there. They're still going to get coyotes at bay, you know, on the place. So that's going to help you out as well. I think help the cattle as well. <clears throat> the, the, the next challenge is just lack of knowledge. This is the biggest thing that, you know, personally, I had to come over with. I've, I raised cattle all my life. Uh, and when I first got into this goat business, 
my my thing was is how hard could this be? They're still ruminants. They're just little cows. That's what I told people. They're just little cows. They are not little cows. And if you treat them like little cows, you will have a disaster. Uh, because they're both ruminants. That's about as close as it comes, in my opinion. There's just so many different things that come into it. The first thing that I had to be get my head around, wrap my head around is death is a part of production. You know, I don't remember losing very many calves and when I or cows for that matter. And when I lost them, I knew what caused it. You know, and so I could fix that problem. I can tell you, you'll if you get in the sheep and goat business, you will lose one and not have a clue what happened. It was fine one day, and the next day you go out there and it's dead and toes up. So, uh, but it's 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 manageable. Don't get me wrong; it's very manageable. But and the reason why I say it's manageable, management's the part of it. You got to keep an eye on these. And then the other part of this is the research that we have on sheep and goats. For example, most of the uh, sheep research is all done on wool sheep, not hair sheep. I'm not saying that there's a difference, but uh, you know, there's a difference between dairy and, and, and meat goats by far. And, and a lot of the research we had done in, on goats is on dairy goat side. And so we're using old, and I'm not gonna say outdated, but maybe needs to be re-looked at research to kind of you know, do some of these things or make recommendations. And so that's a challenge for us because some of it's just not quite right. And then the other thing, increased management, okay? It's, <clears throat> I'm just telling you, you know, we, when we do, when I do a, a cow-calf budget, I budget in six hours per year uh, per cow. And so, you know, if you think along that terms of logic, you think, okay, well, five goats equal one cow, then I should only have to spend one hour per, you know, per sheep or per goat per year. That's all I need. I think if you double or triple that, you'll be closer. Goats take more time. And if we treat them like, again, like cows, if we only look at them every weekend, uh, again, disaster is going to happen because you're going to go out there one weekend and either half of them are going to be gone or dead. Uh, because <clears throat> the problem with it is, is their problems kind of hit pretty quickly. And if you're not there to solve them or fix them, uh, it'll take you out pretty quick. And, and I've seen that happen multiple times, but just because, you know, they thought they could treat them like cows and they can't. So it's going to more management. So if you don't have the time, then that's, you know, I would, you know, worry about that part right there. So to kind of wrap up and, I, and, you know, what I think about is multi-species grazing for everybody. No, quite honestly, it's not. But I do feel, and I've said this once and I'll keep saying this, I think there are a lot of producers out there, cattle producers, that are missing the boat. They do a really good job on their cattle. Uh, they could, you know, they could add the sheep and goats with very little, you know, problem or very big challenge to them, and they're missing a profit potential. And there are some cattle guys out there that have sheep or goats. And if you get them in the back room or get them privately, they'll admit to you that they probably made more money on their sheep and goats than they ever had on their cattle. Now they will not admit it in the cattle shop because again, it's not popular to be a sheep or a goat producer, but I've had more than one or more than several tell me that, that they made more money. So we have the ability, we can improve our profits. We can reduce costs by you know eliminating weed control. Uh, we're, uh, we will have to spend a little money up front on the fencing, but the one thing about the fencing that I forgot to mention is just remember fencing is tax deductible and we're repairing the fence. So I'll be repairs, not, you know, not building. So um, we can do that and, 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 but we can reduce our weed control and, you know, over time. And then also what I think it does is it spreads our risk over multiple enterprises. So right now, you know, cattle are going through the drought. Sheep and goats are pretty I'm not going to say drought resistant, but drought tolerant. They they kind of go through the drought a little easier than cattle do, and so uh, so any, you know so it's not as hard and so to kind of go through these processes, and then you know so we got our risk over multiple enterprises, and you know again helps us out that way. So with that, guys, I am done. And 12:30. I thought it'd take me about 30 minutes. And I, I didn't know if you wanted longer or not. So uh, I know it's lunchtime. So I, I'm, 
I guess I can look at the questions part here. So. Chat disabled. Oh. Yeah, I think I think maybe we're having some problems with the chat. So if you're having problems with the chat and you have a question, you can put that in the Q and A. I know we're getting some feedback there, so appreciate that. Appreciate that information. Um, it, Dr. Dr. Beck just made a comment that, of course, you know most of the uh, most of the new fence going in is five wire to six wire, and uh, that that aligns with what you told us. If we take that cup of hot coffee, if it can get through, <laughs> the goat can get through, right? Right. So, um, talk to us a little bit, JJ, about um, you know we mentioned starting out that that you lead the goat boot camp and that is full at the moment, but talk to us about other resources. If we've got producers on the line that are considering multi-species grazing, uh, where, where do we go for more information? So, so we've got a, we've got an OSU meat goat website and it's meatgoat.okstate.edu. Uh, and on that website, you'll find information about the goat camp. And, and again, I'm, I don't want to, it's kind of, I don't like promoting a camp we've already got full, but Senator, I will tell you, if you're interested in raising meat goats, we basically, you know, we assume you know nothing about raising goats and go through the whole uh, gambit, you know, and in, in for three days you know, and teach you about that. And it'll be every October in Ada, Oklahoma. So we usually open that up around the 1st of April. I, I tell people if they're interested, they probably need to, in, to go ahead and register for it by around the 1st of July, because usually by the 1st of August, we're full. This year, we filled up before then. So, but on that website as well, we, uh, we, and I say we, uh, there's a group of us specialists and county educators, we wrote an, the OSU basic meat goat manual. Yeah, you, you can go down there and keep scrolling down. There's the camp, and then you go, keep going down, it should be there's the manual. So we have written the manual. It's a 15 chapter manual that covers uh, most of the topics that we, you know, well, all the topics that are in the manual are covered in the camp. But, it, you know, if you want to order one of those manuals, you can download that order form, mail it to us. And I think for $20, we'll mail you, uh, mail you the manual. If you, you can't go by your county office, if you're in Oklahoma, run by your county extension office, they may have a copy for sale there. Uh, if they do, you, you can buy it from them as well and, shape, and save some money on shipping. And so there's that opportunity. Uh, our friends at Langston usually put on a goat field day in April. Uh, it's, it's been a pretty good field day. I don't think, I, I don't think they got to have it. The, I know they didn't have it during COVID. I'm not sure if they had it this last year or not. I, I typically get invited to it, and I didn't get invited this year, so I may, made the assumption they wasn't having it. But, but that's in April. That's an all-day Saturday deal. And they cover just a wide range of topics. That's a good place to go. Uh, sheep, you know, uh, there's plenty of sheep information out there, extension sheep information, though. I don't know how much is tailored of it to hair sheep. And so uh, I don't want to speak out of turn and tell you there's differences between hair sheep and wool sheep. But So I'm not sure where to go on the sheep information. Dr. Biggs. Can I, uh, let me ask a question that'll tie into some of these others that folks are asking. <clears throat> maybe maybe let JJ start with, uh, from this perspective and get on to those other questions. But anyway, JJ, my understanding is that the genetics for parasite resistance in goats has improved dramatically over the last five to 10 years. Is that true? And if it is, how do you know animals you are considering purchasing are those to improve genetics well the ge genetics have improved and, and, and to be honest with you in my opinion we did a disservice to the meat goats when we brought them over from south africa because we tried to turn them into cows and tried to graze them down to the ground and, and they're used to eating up high and so we created some of the parasite problems ourselves and then that but and and also by misuse of, of, of dewormers, because, you know, the old saying was when we first got into it, there was people deworming their goat herd every 30 days. And so we just created our own problems. But now we're selecting for parasite resistance. The Kiko breed has done a really good job of selecting for Kiko resist or for parasite resistance. The boar breed has probably not been selecting that hard. 
but it's been my experience that there's problems in each one of the breeds. And so if I'm going to be safe, I would try to buy my replacements from somebody who's been selecting for parasite, you know, not keeping those problems. You don't want to buy the problems from them, but you want to talk to somebody, you know, for example, in my little operation, if I have to worm you too many times in a year, you're not hanging around to have babies. And so, uh, you know, so you, I would only sell replacement females from those females who don't have problems and issues. And so that's where I would go. And again, I know a lot of the, some breeds, they promote that. They try to promote that parasite resistance, but I would, I would definitely just check with the fruit, whoever I'm buying them from to see what his parasite management is. Uh, you know, how much, how many times a year he has to do it and what he selects for. And then that's where I would go from that. So based on that um, discussion about parasites and, and resistance and the genetic uh, component to that, since we are in a drought, right? That's one reason why we're talking about minimizing cost in, in a variety of operations. Talk to us about parasites in, in drought years and how that may or may not impact uh, the goat herd? Well, actually, par the droughts help, help the parasite problem because it's hot and dry and parasites don't like hot and dry weather. Uh, that's the reason why the meat goats come from South Africa where it's hot and dry. They, they don't have parasite problems in South Africa. We created it when we come up here and put them in, the, in Southeast Oklahoma where we get 50 inches of rain. Uh, but so the the drought has really kind of helped, uh, helped that. And, and I, I can, I can kind of prove that, uh, we do a, the OSU does that meat goat, uh, forage based buck test in Wilberton. And so every two weeks we're taking fecal samples and, and doing egg counts and the egg counts are really low this year because it's just dry, it's hot and dry. So it really helps us from that standpoint, uh, because, uh, parasites just don't like that hot and dry weather. Maybe we'll see a handful of benefits out of the drought, I suppose. It's, uh, it, it's glass, glass half full or empty, I suppose. Right. Talk to us a little bit more about, um, about dogs. And, uh, you know, as, as guards, like, are we, you know, are there certain breeds we need to be looking for? How many dogs per number of goats? Uh, what are your recommendations there? So, so there are certain breeds there and, you know, called guardian animals, uh, not guard dogs. We're not talking about German shepherds or Dobermans. We're talking about uh, uh, guardian animals. The, the most popular and most well-known is the Great Pyrenees. Uh, and, but Great Pyrenees, Anatolians, Akbashes, oh, uh, Commodores. Uh, I, I personally want to try a Commodore because I, I, I remember the old uh, uh, Sam the Sheepdog days when I was a kid. And that's what saying the sheepdog was a commodore he's that dog he can't, he's got hair down to here you can't see but so any any one of these dogs you know as long as they're you know they're that kind of breed you know bred for that's what you got to look for and so here, here's what i will tell you don't get your dog uh you know the free the free great pyrenees dog that's in the shop and swap probably not the dog you're going to want okay chances are that's a problem though but but you can go you can go get them from producers dogs are not really hard to find as far as how many well that's just personal preference um uh, i'm gonna be honest with you the, the minimum i think you need are two uh and it doesn't matter to me male female uh just remember if you have an intact male and an intact female that means you know eventually you end up with puppies uh and that's okay if you're set up to to do puppies but puppies creates another little issue because now while that mom's having puppies, she's not guarding the, the goats. And so, and then uh, you'll find if you get on Facebook, you'll find that everybody's got guardian puppies for sale. And so the market is, you know, kind of floated out there and stuff. And so, you know, but that is a revenue stream you can't get into uh, if you want to. But so number minimum of two, I kind of look at it, how many pastures, you know, how many different herds or sets of goats you're going to have. So at my house, at any one time, I could have three pastures going at once. So I have six dogs. I have two for each pasture. Okay. And so, and you now right now I have more six dogs. So I have two litters of pups. Again, you know, I could tell you about the pups thing. So, but, but, but I have, I have, I have two dogs and, and, you know, one pasture is two males 
one pasture was a male and female, one pasture was a male and female. And so that's what I've, uh, uh, I've got running at the house. Now, I, there was a time that I had two dogs total. And so, you know, it's, it's, I've run the gamut, but I, I do like to have the fact that I got at least two dogs running with each group at one time. So <clears throat> now I'm only down to two groups running. So I've got four dogs running with one group and two dogs running with the other group. So it's, uh, uh, and six dogs may be too many uh, for my little bitty operation. Uh, uh, but I've been through the time where a dog didn't have any. That cost me about four lambs. And so. so JJ, we've got a couple of questions that relate to this and, and one of them uh, submitted by one of our senior veterinary students. So certainly rec uh, recognize that they're joining us today and uh, as one of their instructors, I, I kind of like that. So talk to us about, is there opportunity uh, you know, maybe we're not talking about it at the coffee shop, right? But is there opportunity for cattle producers to collaborate, work hand in hand with small ruminant operations so that maybe we get that seasonal weed control without having to deal with year long management of sheep and goats? Are, are you seeing any of that? I'm not seeing any of it, but I'm not saying that's, you know, that's probably that's an opportunity. The, the big question is a goat producer or a sheep producer. My first question to the cattle guys, what do your fences look like? And so if they have the fence set up, then I would probably have no problem in working, you know, uh, you know that, that would allow me to actually run more animals than I've actually got, uh, you know, now. But I just, most cattle guys are going to go in, that I've run to have just went in and bought the animals themselves and run it themselves. Most, uh, most sheep and goat guys are not, running out and buying cattle because they just don't have the property or the land to do so. So if if we're someone that wants to go out and and maybe get a set of does, what what kind of availability is out there and what are we looking like as far as average cost? So that that's going to be the tough part is is availability uh, because there's really not a central site to go to. Uh, you know, you can go to Facebook, of course. But they're out there. You just got to, you got to kind of, you got to, it's going to take a little more to a simple search. And then as far as, uh, you know, I would, I wouldn't buy them through the cell barn unless that cell barn, unless you like, for example, I did buy a set out of the leech cell barn, but it was a special sale. They were come from, you know, farms that were, you know, special sale. I wouldn't just go and show up to, you know, and buy somebody's set of calls. But as far as price goes, sheep are going to be cheaper than goats. Goats are going to be probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about 300 per doe right now. Maybe a little cheaper now with the drought, but I would say 300. Uh, a, a male is going to cost you right around 500. Because I will tell you, you buy, you can probably find cheaper. Get what you pay for. The same as buying that cheap old cow, Dr. Lawman, you know, you get what you pay for. And so... Uh, three, 300 for the female side of it, 500 for the male, the, the, the sheep side of it, probably closer to two, two and a half, and still about 500 for that male. Uh, Obviously, we've got some variability on how many head you can run per acre, but do you have any kind of rules of thumb on, you know, how many, let's say, it, what's the difference between sheep and goats? Um, and then what's the difference when we do multi-species grazing together? I know you mentioned that increasing grazing capacity about 25%, if I remember correctly. Um, right. You know, what, what are our numbers look like per acre? So, so what I always tell folks when they, when, when they want to run sheep and sheep or goats, I, I make the assumption there's very little uh, difference in the far as uh, the stocking rates of sheep and goats. So I always tell folks the easiest way to figure out your stocking rates for sheep and goats is to figure out what the stocking rate for cattle is. So if it's six acres per cow and we put five, acre, five goats or five sheep equal one cow, then you're looking at right at 1.2 acres per goat. So that's, the, you know, that's the kind of stocking rate you know, I go to. So now, if we're going to multi-species graze and we're stocked correctly, you know, with cattle, we're going to have to, to add sheep and goats. We're going to have to pull some cows off. We can't just do it. But what it is is for every four goats or no, we can, we can, so we can add five goats. 
I got to do the math in my head. I should have done the math before we got on this talk because I knew he was going to ask me that question. Um, it's, I wrote, yeah, I would say you, for every six goats or six sheep that you add, you're going to have to remove one cow. So that would keep the stocking rate pretty much the same. You know, because I say five equals one and you can increase it by 25%. So that's going to be about 1.25. So I would say six goats equal, six goats or sheep equal one cow. So, so if I'm running 50 cows, and I want to add, say, let's do the math easy, six into 36, I'm going to have to take off six cows. And, and I know 36 doesn't sound like a huge number of sheep and goats. Trust me, that's a lot of work. I Remember, I told you, you know, it's going to take more work per sheep and goat than you're thinking. And so it, it's uh, sometimes I think that you know, my little small herd of, of, of 40 is way too many. That's why you're not supposed to count, JJ. That way, uh, uh, you you don't you don't put the pen to paper if you don't count count how many you got out there. Um, back back to that question about maybe collaboration between cattle producers and goat producers or or whatnot. Got a question on: Is there an opportunity? Or does it make sense to to purchase feeder goats um, for sixty to ninety days in the summer months? It's just like cattle. It's the spring of the high the high prices. You know, if I showed you a seasonality chart, you'd see that the spring's the high prices. So you're buying at the high time of the year and you're going to sell at the low time of the year. Can you make it work? I, you know, you know, it's goats only gain on average on grass about a quarter of a pound a day. So, I mean, keeping them 90 days, you're not going to put, you know, 20 pounds. You know, it's and so I've never really been able to put much of a pencil as far as profit goes. But now I do tell folks if brush control is their main deal and they really want to do that. And you can fence the area or off that you're wanting to kind of control and overstock it for 90 to 120 days. We're not looking at profit. We're just looking at, it doesn't cost me, you know, if I break even, I've made money because I didn't have to spray that acreage. Does that make sense? So it's, so it kind of depends on people, what people are wanting to do. Uh, but but the, the background in the goats or stocking of goats, it, it does make some money, but you got to, again, it's like putting a pencil to it. You got to, you know, you, if you can and what's your sell price. And I don't have any risk protection for goats. You know, it's, I'm, I'm at the mercy of the market. So it's it's a little more difficult. And, and I'm not saying it doesn't work, but you got to be a little more careful with that. One. So a couple more, a couple more, hopefully quick questions here. Uh, sand burr control. That's a, a constant problem, right? Uh, goats, goats going to help us there or no? Goat, goats can do some sandbur control. They will, you know, they will eat the sandburrs. And, and I will tell you, there's not a sandbur in my goat and sheep pastures. There's sandburrs in my yard. So I do have sandbur problem, but not very big. So it's, uh, they will control it. It's just like anything else. You, you got to get them out there before they form that seed head, you know, that sandbur, and then they'll, they'll eat it then. All right, and any any need on if we're running goats with cows to to bring those goats back in at night? Um, any variability whether we're using the guardian dogs or not, uh, or can we run run the goats with the cows twenty four hours a day? You can run the goats twenty four you know twenty four seven. The, the the thing you're gonna have to worry about bringing them in is if you've got a, a you know predator problem because that's when the predators are gonna come out is at night, and so. If, if you're having a predator problem or something like that, then you might want to bring them in, but you don't have to. You can run them out there, you know, the whole time uh, with, the, with the sheep. And what you'll think, it, it's segregation at its best. The cows will be over in this corner of the pasture. The goats will be over here in this corner of the pasture, and they won't mix. Uh, and, so, and the dogs will be around the goats. So you don't have to bring them in. Uh, matter of fact, I don't like the idea of bringing them. That's just, that's more extra work added to me. I, I want them to be able to kind of you know make it out there on their own so. all right well i do want to point out dr whitworth uh another one of our extension veterinarians has sent some really useful information i'm hoping you can see that in the chat but a um, little bit more information on the genetic susceptibility uh when it comes to parasites and uh, some options there to take a look at as well as um, a fairly recent uh article here by two of our other ag economists on the economic feasibility of mixed species grazing to improve the rangeland productivity. Dr. Lawman, are you seeing any additional questions? Dr. 
Dr. You Lama, you're muted. muted. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to who wants to tell him? Yeah, he's got to buy lunch today because he was the, the first fine one to get this it. Yeah. time around. Not uncommon. JJ, uh, so it, I would, uh, uh, again, uh, it's been a while since I've reviewed this literature, but the more diverse your country, you know, the more browse you have, different species and so on, I would think the, the number that you gave in terms of like six goats uh, per, what, per cow, is that how we say that? Yeah. Um, could could increase the more diversity, the more monoculture you have, probably the lower that number would would need to be. I, I'd agree with that because if you've got a lot of, you know, pasture, I mean, browse, you know, trees and stuff like that, the cows are not grazing in that anyway. So you put the, you can put more goats in, and they're, and they will run to that first. It's, I mean, I could, I, so I tell this story, I planted wheat one time and uh, got it up and growing, and uh, I let the goats out on it, and they ran through the wheat into the trees and started eating acorns. So uh, that's amazing. It, you know, now they got around to eating the wheat. Don't get me wrong, but but they ran through the wheat pasture mm. into the tree line and started eating down there. So it's uh, it's just it's it's real it's real fun and entertaining to raise sheep and goats, and frustrating at the same time. But it's, yeah. Last thing, are you seeing any of these uh, small companies where they were uh, offering goat grazing services to control brush? I know, th you know, there were a few of those around for a while. I haven't looked recently. Yeah, I've, I've not seen any locally. You know, I know in California, they use goats to graze the hillsides off and, th and they're paying people to do that. But, he but here in Oklahoma... I don't think it ever took off to say, you know, to graze it. Um, okay. So, I mean, but I do know in other places, other states, and, and, but I think it's the government in California that's paying that price, not, uh -huh. the, not the landowners. So, Dr. Biggs, I just want to thank everyone for attending today. And I would encourage you, if you did not get to see J.C. Hobbs' presentation last week on taxes in a cow-calf enterprise. It was tremendous. We've had a lot of feedback on that, and uh, it, is, it is just valuable information. If you haven't sought that recording out, if you didn't get to see it, I highly encourage you to go to our website, beef.okstate.edu, and go find that uh, archived uh, video. Definitely. Always learning a little bit more. Uh, anytime we get to listen to JC and JJ as well. So JJ, thanks so much for being with us today. Um, we want to make sure that we recognize we got one more session in this series. Dr. Lawman is going to visit with us about minimizing uh, the winter supplement cost uh, for you in your operation. And that is on tap next Thursday, the 18th. So uh, Dr. Beck, Dr. Lawman, anything I've forgotten? All right, with that, I did I did get a suggestion. One goat song was suggested uh, from The Sound of Music, and so I had forgotten <laughs> that one, but only if Julie Andrews sings it am I interested in that. So uh, with that, we'll hope you guys uh, have, hope our attendees today have, have a good day. Uh, finish out the rest of your week uh, starting school today in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and lots of schools across uh, across Oklahoma are doing that as well. So uh, thanks for joining us today. Hope it's been beneficial. Make sure you check out those previous recordings at beef.okstate.edu and uh, we will see you next week.